Uh, good morning, it's Richard Piers of Finextra TV. I'm delighted today to be joined uh, by James Lockhart-Smith. He's the VP of Markets for V-Risk Maplecroft. James, how are you? Uh, very well, Richard, and very good to be speaking to you again. You are getting to the end of the year. It's been a busy year and you've uh, been very kind to spend a lot of time with us on the Sustainable Finance Live advisory board and, and leading uh, a workshop uh, in our last session on December the 1st and 2nd. Uh, particularly this one, of course, focused on supply chain data and how that actually contributes to the understanding of risk uh, in the capital markets. Tell us a little bit about the role of, of V-Risk uh, Maplecroft. What, what do you do in this area? Well, Verisk as, a, Verisk as a whole has a strong focus on data analytics, and we're kind of pretty well established as maybe the leading standard setter in the insurance industry, and then in, increasingly in relation to other areas of uh, of the economy. And I think, you know, sustainability and resilience is really key to what we do as a whole. If I move to, you know, Maplecroft in particular as part of Verisk, uh, we work with both corporates and the financial sector to help them understand, identify, take action uh, with regards to geospatial uh, ESG risks, climate risks, uh, and then from a resilience perspective, political and other disruption risks. And, you know, as Maplecroft, we've been around for two decades. We were acquired by Verisk in 2014. So we use the term ESG for convenience to encompass a kind of pinata of all types of issues, as, as many do. But we're really trying to think in more depth about all of the sustainability related impacts and dependencies of companies and governments around the world. And I think in that regard, we're a bit different from the traditional heartland of corporate ESG as normally understood in the equities and corporate debt space. So, you know, that whole ecosystem of sort of interrogating and transforming self-reported uh, company data points from CSR reports into outputs for investors. And that, you know, I think that still maybe dominates the conversation a bit in terms of ESG. Um, all of that is well and good. And it set the scene for what we're now seeing, which is this kind of convergence of sustainability accounting standards and what I think will be the emergence of a disintermediated sort of corporate sustainability data value chain, if you will, in terms of minimum common, common standards. But it's not really risk based or spatial in nature insofar as you're looking at KPIs or policies published by a company headquarters. It's kind of scratching the surface. And what I mean by that is that uh, I guess at Maplecroft, we're looking at business activities, industries, commodities, companies as things which can really be disaggregated in space and put in their uh, contextual and sustainability context around the world on the understanding that that's just key to their externalities. So, you know, the essence of what we're really doing is scoring locations, industries, commodities for all aspects of ESG, sustainability, climate, political risks. You know, everything gets quantified. We have well over a thousand different source inputs and we sort of began bootstrapping about a decade and a half ago with, you know, third party structured data because that's where you begin, right? And that's where a lot of the conversation outside Maplecroft now is in relation to so-called uh, free data. But over the years, other types of data have become become more and more important to us. So satellite or highly granular remote sensor based data sets, machine learning, interrogation of large volumes of unstructured text, uh, and then sort of internal expert based scoring um, using our in house teams of analysts on some key uh, governance and political issues at the country level. Um, a lot of our indices and a growing number are really granular and subnational, not just environment, but across uh, human and labor rights and political risk as well. Now, what are we doing with that? All of that gets fed into analytics that speak to the footprints of the companies and investors we work with. So on the corporate side, management teams are looking at their own operations and their own supply chains, trying to understand their impacts and dependencies. And then on the financial side, investors and banking clients are looking at their portfolios through this geospatial risk perspective, which we think is pretty complementary and separate to the usual focus on, you know, corporate ESG headquarter policies and KPIs. And the particular approach that's taken will vary by asset class. So be it sovereign debt, commodities, real asset or corporates. But that principle is always the same, namely that where your footprint is in the world shapes your externalities and your dependencies. Now, as we all know, supply, ch supply chains are probably the most opaque part of that. But we have all of the underlying locational data, and this comes to life when end-to-end -end, uh, data on supply chain connections and relationships is integrated. And so you must listen to this whole sort of debate, you know, that's going on in the market of people that are going, oh, I think we need supply chain data. There is no supply chain data. There is no, you know, data about assets, you know, in the in the in the material world. 
and, and you must go, hang, well, hang on a minute. You know, yes, of course there is. We've been working on this, as you say, for over 10 years. So given that, you know, when you work in, in this and you join in this workshop, um, you know, what do you bring from it? What do you take from it? How does the format work for you? Well, yeah, I think there's a big difference between data that exists, right, and then data that is available at the point of use at scale for all of the capital market participants who need to use it for it to be properly priced in it. And I think that's a lot of the, you know, that's a lot of the work that's that, 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 that that's going on now. In terms of the, um, you know, in terms of the workshop, I mean, just on on format, it's probably no surprise to you the format is always very unique and welcome. I think we're always used we're pr all used to fairly structured webinars or conferences where, you know, everything and everybody's roles is sort of prearranged with little room for collaboration, little room for spontaneity. I've sometimes joked you should take recordings of some of the major events and sort of repackage them as sort of, you know, insomnia cures, right, for people who struggle to sleep. So SF.Live is completely different. You know, the idea that yes, you are going to have a few pre-prepared presentations to help focus everybody's minds but then you move into sort of genuine workshop mode not not you know not just pre-baked panel mode but proper workshop mode to think through from problems which we generally know about to innovations and solutions that we perhaps don't know about and we all know workshops from uh, you know closed door formats in our own organizations but doing that in this kind of context is quite different and I think underlying those differences in format is a difference in ethos that is kind of welcome and needed and involves a, a certain amount of healthy tension for those of us in the private sector. So what you're being asked to do is discuss with a range of external entities, some of whom may be competitors. I think it's about maybe, you know, understanding that system level changes are needed if markets and business are going to move fast enough to avoid worst case climate and natural capital outcomes, uh, as well as to su succeed generally in improving sustainability. And so there has to be a role for this kind of collaborative activity insofar as no, the, the answer lies with no single uh, single organization and then you have this fantastic background and mix of expertise of the interlocutors so you know environmental and climate scientists key stakeholders and leaders from the uh, in business investment banking world and then to those who are sort of at the forefront of data analytics including various startups and even others with you know legal or other perspectives so it's pretty unique and it's a good counterpoint to what you sometimes see in other contexts without that kind of a, a, a breadth of participants. So I guess, you know, I was mainly involved in the third and last workshop on the data provider focus where we were looking at the digital twin of physical assets. So I do enjoy the role of leader or moderator, but whenever I do it, I then remember that it's actually harder than being a contributor where you just say your piece, you know, as the leader, you have to kind of try and steer the conversation to ensure that everybody gets as much value out of it as they as they can. So anyway, we were looking at the extent to which it's going to be possible to address you know, some of these glaring uh, data challenges or what are commonly identified as such in the supply chain. And I came into it with the perspective of some recent research we'd done looking at those kind of close connections between degradation of the natural environment, economic incentives, and then human rights abuses at a global level, as well as the predominant role of commodity export uh, uh, supply chains. So I guess key to our general approach and something that came out very clearly in the workshop is that, you know, the reason this supply chain data challenge is so important is that good intentions and disclosures by the largest companies in the world are only really the starting point because a large, a very large proportion of social and environmental harms happen right down close to the beginning of the supply chain or the value chain. And economic incentives are so powerful that nature and people will continue to be exploited unless, you know, data can fundamentally, well, data and policy can fundamentally change those incentives. So we had the chance to hear from a really interesting startup, Tree Economy, on what they are building in relation to forest offsets uh, and the carbon cycle and kind of use this as a springboard into um, a broader conversation about whether it's possible to use digital ledger technology and other approaches to fundamentally begin to track units of value up the supply chain and trace them right back down to the source. And I think a key, a key distinction here uh, is really the difference between data that helps sort of track units of value in relation to, for example, with tree economy, carbon sequestration on the one hand, and then on the other hand, data that helps companies and investors up and down the supply chain uh, measure and react to or price sustainability impacts. So by the first, I mean, for example, you have data that tracks a unit of carbon 
allows it to be sort of transacted and exchanged appropriately, even while the physical commodity, you know, the tree stays in place. And by the second, you're going to have data which is going to tell you about environmental or human rights abuses or, you know, on the converse, maybe environmental enrichment in particular places, in particular times, in ways that are linked to particular goods and services which have passed up the value chain. And I think on the first of those, you know, on the on the sort of uh, units of value side, we did have to deal with one kind of elephant in the room, which was the sort of computational energy requirements associated with, uh, you know, blockchain that everybody knows from sort of the crypto world. But, you know, we did have some sort of good discussion on that and a certain degree of uh, assurance on, on that side from technical experts in the room. Um, but there was still a bit of pushback on, you know, maybe the sort of data storage and energy requirements of some of these incredibly granular uh, data sets which are being created, which, you know, is maybe something we arguably don't don't think about enough in, in, in the data analytics world. So what came out of the workshop very clearly was that both types of data, you know, the units of value and then the data that supports other decisions about value are incredibly important and can be thought about in related ways, really. Uh, we had a good conversation about reforestation and afforestation in the context of carbon sequestration. I think we were all agreed that forest has to mean forest in this regard, both in developed and emerging markets, if we're going to have outcomes that uh, do enough in terms of carbon sequestration and actually work holistically with and support and enhance natural capital and biodiversity in general. Otherwise, we really are headed for disaster. And I think personally, I think also there needs to be more attention to the enormous uh, sequestration potential of of wetlands. We did also talk about that. Um, something else which came out is, you know, we need to think holistically. I already said that, but I'll just reiterate it about carbon versus other natural capital and even social risk issues at a at a system level you know um uh, carbon is obviously uh, existentially important but we need to look beyond it um there was also um you know something else which came out was really on sort of the landscape approach that when we're looking at you know supply chains and that kind of last mile problem of you know who uh, who produces what you don't have to think of it as a sort of fractally infinite regression into ever more layers of detail. Um, a lot of the um, environmental science stakeholders on the call kind of stress the relevance of the landscape approach that, you know, if you can begin to sort of capture um, data and think about data and think about management at that landscape level, um, you know, be it the watershed or below, um, you know, in some cases significantly below, then you can kind of you can kind of organize your your data analytics and your aggregation around that in a way. And then you work with policymakers um, to try and ensure that the right incentives are created at the level below that in order for things to work properly. So in other words, you don't necessarily have to be capturing um, you know, the last kilo of coffee produced by the last and smallest SME in some particular, um, you know, valley um, uh, in a particular country, right? You can sort of stop above that. Um, my, you know, m my takeaway, I think, really at the end was that there is, of course, a need to keep on improving data inputs. And we are going to see, um, you know, terabytes and petabytes and even more of, you know, data being created into the future. But at a fundamental level, most of the pieces of the puzzle, most of the technology is is already out there. And what's actually needed is more of a sort of linking exercise, a coordination exercise across all of these different data sets. You know, we already have the data on geospatial and climate and sustainability risks in a highly granular way, obviously at, you know, Verisk, but then in other places as well. Um, the technology already exists to measure you know, units of carbon, for example, in supply chains at scale, and you can extend that into other domains. Um, the asset level business data actually already exists, albeit in a pretty fragmented way. And then the connectivity data also already exists, be it either in terms of, you know, data sets built on sort of disclosure and reverse disclosure, you know, who's saying their supplier was or wasn't or who their who their client is, but then also, um, you know, the modeling approach. And I, I think the technology exists and the will exists to really move into much larger, you know, networked data sets and, and, and sort of platforms, if you will, in this regard. So, you know, there's a lot more to do, but but I mean, a lot of the data is already there. Yeah, I think that's just such a, a fantastic sort of uh, dissection and analysis of the workshop and also conclusion, you know, that, that, that I've seen, which it really is about sort of creating that connective tissue. Um, tell us just, uh, you know, in, in looking to the year ahead, if you will, 
um, you know, what's got on top of your mind um, once you've got past a, a hopefully a well-earned break, but for, for Virus Maplecroft and, you know, what's the market going to be doing almost, you know, your sort of prediction of the key drivers? Is it just now, bang, we're off and running and it's just the connective tissue? What's happening in your mind? Well, just just sort of building on the second part of your question, I think we are seeing a, a quite rapid change in sort of the zeitgeist and general mood in terms of investor ESG in general, which is pretty pretty exciting for those of us who've been in, in the space for a long time organizationally, in that, um, you know, with the mainstream mainstreaming of ESG came the risk of, uh, frankly, greenwashing or washing out social impacts or kind of, you know, incrementalism, little, little optimizations of the position of the deck chairs on the Titanic, to use yeah. that metaphor, and then nothing fundamentally changing. And, um, you know, I think but societally, obviously, we've had a big shock with uh, uh, the pandemic, you know, everybody's been reminded just how important some of, um, you know, these system issues are. And then regulators have really begun to push back on this greenwashing question. And, you know, asset owners at the top of the investment chain have also begun to do the same. So that's actually, you know, really exciting, I think, and huge opportunity there to really improve what we all collectively do. Now, for, for, for Varisk Maplecroft in particular, I guess the next year, you know, should see us continuing to sort of refine and improve our data. I think probably no surprise, a key focus is climate analytics as we take advantage of new data sets, work holistically through some of the um, system level interactions, physical scenarios at different timeframes with all of the other data we have on, you know, political risk, economics, natural capital. Um, I think it's often forgotten that, you know, climate change is just one of the areas where we as a species are currently exceeding, you know, planetary boundaries. Biodiversity is one of the others. Actually, we're exceeding it by a greater margin than we are on, on, on carbon. And so in general, when we're talking about climate change and natural capital, we're sort of talking about this interaction between human and Earth systems, if you will. Um, so that's something that I guess, you know, is top of mind for us coming into the new year. Um, I guess on the investor side in particular, you know, further movement in relation to the application of our data to asset classes. Um, I would characterize us as a leader in sovereign ESG in terms of our, da our data and who uses it, but we have uh, more to do there. And then there are a host of other applications and areas that we're working on. So I think a lot of that involves moving, to be frank, to meet expanding areas of regulatory focus, as I was just talking about, both directly and actually indirectly as layered into the expectations of, um, you know, asset owners in terms of where the boundaries of being pushed quite aggressively, uh, you know, who's expected to report what and at what level of detail. And of course, you know, we'll continue to sort of build our advisory practice and work hand in hand with investors who are really trying to deepen their foothold in ESG and corporation and, 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 and management. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks for an outstanding collaboration this year. Look forward to more. As you say, there's a lot more to do. Um, and in the meantime, you know, have a wonderful rest, have a good break with the family. Happy Christmas, happy new year and speak to you soon. Thanks so much, Richard. Same to you. And I should just say, you know, any to any of your listeners, please do, you know, if you have any questions coming out of this, please do feel free to reach out directly to me on LinkedIn or to info at maplecroft.com. And, you know, we'll be very happy to talk further. Superb. Speak to you soon. Bye now. Thanks so much. Bye bye.